Praise the Lord for the wonderful work that he does, not through just Brother Lemmy or Brother Avrel or Sister Felicia, but through each and every one of you who decide not only to give a dollar, but to pray for the work that the Lord is doing in the Philippines. Uh, may God bless you guys and Brother Yonutz as well uh, for the work that you guys have done. And we're so happy to have you back home. Umkyu and Tusha, congratulations. I did not know that your anniversary is coming up. Uh, that is awesome. Is that what the pizza's for after church? Is for the anniversary? Yes, okay, good. Okay, so just so you know, we do have food after church today. Today is a special day, so don't hurry off anywhere. We will have fellowship uh, down the hall uh, for everyone after church today. So <clears throat> thank the Lord for that. Um, while the tech team gets uh, the PowerPoint ready today, I would like to just include myself in community time. We've had great testimonies about how God heals. We've had uh, uh, opportunity for children to, to um, recite biblical passages that they have stored in their hearts. And I also want to, I know we're running out of time, but it's okay. I like it when we make God look great rather than you know me or anyone else look great. And the best way to do that is just tell everyone how awesome he is. And not only how he answers prayers, he does, and how we've heard that he heals. Um, but last week at the Lord's Supper, um, for the last few weeks, uh, it just seemed that every single Saturday night or Sunday morning, one of our kids were getting sick. And it wasn't even cold yet. So we were wondering what's going on. Because now what we understand, now that it's cold, now that if we forget the hat or the jacket or the boots, right away they get sick. But this was still when it was hot outside. And so last week, um, you know, my wife took the, uh, the, the youngest one to the doctors, and uh, they decided, oh, she has an infection, she has a virus, uh, she has an ear infection, and um, so we're just going to just give her all these antibiotics, and you're on your way. And normally, that, that's just it. That's how it goes. But knowing now, probably more than what our parents knew, that we can't just antibiotic everything because it does damage. And so unless it's absolutely necessary... It's probably best not to. And so my wife got the antibiotics, and before we gave her any medicine or before we decided to administer anything, we decided, you know what, let's pray about it as a family, and then tomorrow is the Lord's Supper, thankfully. And, um, you know, not all tradition is bad, and one of the traditions that we hold to is to pray for the sick, to anoint them with oil and have the elders pray for them when we come together as a family to share in the Lord's Supper. And so she wasn't here. She was at home sick. Uh, and we just prayed over um, a napkin, uh, anointed it with oil. And then we went home. Uh, I went home after church, and we gathered the family together. We put the uh, napkin on her ear, and we prayed for her. And we wanted to see how it goes. And then we did some other things. We gave her some garlic oil, and we did all these other things. But we were just very worried about giving someone so young antibiotics. And by the grace of God, she slept through the night. Not like she did the night before. She was no more fever, no more temperature. And, and so I know that for some people, it's just like, well, you know, that's not a big, that's not cancer. That's not liver problems. That's not hepatitis or anything like that. But for us um, to show the children, she has two other young sisters, that when we pray and when we do what the Bible says, when we're sick, to call on the elders, anoint them with oil, and that God does mighty things through prayer, I want to encourage the church, not just our daughters, that God, even today, like the brother mentioned before, uh, does miracles, and he heals, and he works in the lives of his children. So I would like to, to close out community time by saying just how good and great God is. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm happy that all of you are here. We have visitors. We have new people. We have people that have been here for a long time. Um, but I'm happy that we got to do together as a family at this church what the Bible instructs us to do. If you sang together with the worship team, you fulfilled scripture when it says that when we come together to sing praises to the Lord. And you actually fulfilled those scripture. When we talked about the time of community where we had the children fulfill scripture or, or we had testimonies about how good God is, you fulfilled scripture by coming up here and singing a song of praise for the Lord you know, it was a nice classic Romanian one. I haven't heard it in a long time, right? And so you fulfilled scripture by bringing glory to God. And, and for the next few minutes, we're going to ask you to fulfill scripture in two ways. One is to 
preach the word of God or to listen to the word of God, to meditate on the word of God. And then last but not least, our most important thing that we do as, at this church is to come and pray to God. For this is a house of prayer amongst many different things that we would like it to be, but God defines it as a place to pray. And I think the best way to pray is to respond. We heard the wonderful songs of the Lord. We heard wonderful testimony of the Lord. We'll now dive into the word of the Lord, and I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit then brings us to prayer in the Lord's name. Amen? Amen. So the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, this isn't my sermon. This is just so you know why we're here. The Bible tells us, preach the word. And it's good to talk about testimonies of how good God heals. It's amazing. But the word needs to be central to what we do here. Amen. We need to be prepared, not only myself as a preacher, but you as well, at school, at work, amongst your friends, to be prepared in season and out of season to correct, to rebuke, and to encourage. Some of us only like to encourage, right? Because nobody has any problems with people who encourage. But the Bible is calling us to also correct and also rebuke. But how? In great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers. Not just one, not just two, not on just one channel, not on just one streaming platform, but on many for those teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And unfortunately, they will turn their ears away from the truth of God and instead listen to the myths in this world. And so I take it with all uh, seriousness as well as uh, a privilege to be able to expound a little bit on Scripture. Now, I know most of you think that um, 28 minutes isn't enough time or is a lot of time, but for me it's not enough time. So the good news is the next time I'm on the, the schedule, we'll just continue. Because today's lesson is so important that, um, I mean, it won't, 28 days isn't enough, let alone 28 minutes. But so that we can not only give honor and reverence to the Lord and to his word, so we can also pay attention, let's stand as we read Matthew chapter 6. We're continuing in the sermon series of the Sermon on the Mount, probably the most, if not the most, important sermon ever preached, ever recorded, and maybe one that we don't often pay attention to too much. So let's, if you have your scriptures or if you have your Bible app or whatever you may have, if you don't, it should, yep, it's on the TV over there. Let's um, concentrate on what Jesus is saying. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor do they reap nor do they gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles, the unbelievers, seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Amen, and you may be seated. I think in a day like today, not because of what most recently happened on the news between Israel and what is going on in the Middle East, but I think, and it's not just because of COVID, and it's not just because of what we have surrounding us in the news, but I think that this generation or these 
people in the walk of life in 2023, whether you ask a young person or an elderly person, anxiety is a part of their life. Worrying is a part of their life. And Christ comes out to teach us, those who follow in Christ, not to be anxious. And we see multiple times in Scripture, this isn't just a one-off teachings from Christ. And he says, well, he's not really uh, relevant to today's day and age. And we'll talk about that. Because it seems like, and working with young people, or like I said, with those who might be elderly, it seems like anxiousness, worriness, depression is growing more and more and more. It used to be a little bit higher in young ladies from our uh, working with camps and with youth. And now even the young men are bringing this into their life. For the young ladies, it was, I'm never going to get married. And so they were anxious and they were worried and they were depressed. And now the young men are anxious and depressed because they can't provide a lifestyle that these young ladies see and want from the culture that surrounds them. And so now they're both anxious and we have to tell them, hey, 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 Jesus has the answer. Don't worry about it. Okay, read your Bible. You don't, that's okay. Listen to this sermon. You don't, well, we have it continuing next week. So come, come next week. But Jesus always has the answer and is always timely in our lives. It doesn't matter if we lived in Romania in 1950 or we live in America in 2020. The words of Christ, the teachings of Christ, the principles of what he teaches stand firm as truths for us. Amen. Now you might say, well, Brother Chris, I don't know when was the last time that I worried about what I was going to eat or what I was going to drink. And so does this message, does Christ's teaching pertain to me in 2023? Because by sheer virtue of living in the United States, and I don't want to minimize uh, those who are listening in Africa with the Teresa missions, which they do have concerns about where their next meal are coming for their orphans or for their children. I understand that's, that, that is an issue. I don't want to minimize our parents and grandparents who lived in Romania, and many of them didn't know where their next meal or the next state of protection or their next uh, home or dwelling place would come from. But now in 2023, especially towards the younger people, I have to admit, and maybe you guys don't have to admit, but I don't remember when the last time I thought to myself and worried to the point of being anxious of where is my food going to come from? I know where my food comes from. My food comes from Farmer Jack. Well, he doesn't exist anymore. So it comes from Kroger, or it comes from Fresh Time, or it comes from wherever. And even when there is a pandemic, global pandemic, and shortages of toilet paper, and shortages of, I don't know, what else was short? There was still food. Yes, it was maybe less, maybe it was more expensive, but even when I showed up to the store, I knew that there was always going to be something there. And by living in this country, we have to interpret in our culture, in our day and age, that this is still an issue, anxiety. But maybe it's not because I don't know where I'm going to eat, or I don't know what I'm going to drink, or I don't know where I'm going to have clothing or protection or housing. You see, this was the initial worry of the original Christians. By accepting that Jesus is the Messiah, by accepting that he is the Son of Man, the Son of God, come to take away the sins of the world, these people were ostracized. These people were thrown out of their communities. These people weren't allowed to come to synagogue. These people were thrown out of their courts of their homes and thrown out to the streets. Something that doesn't happen to us when we proclaim the goodness of God, that Jesus is Lord, that there is salvation through him. No one throws us out into the streets. But for the early Christians, this was going to be an issue. And so Christ addresses the concerns in their hearts. I love that Jesus addresses the concerns of my heart, and I'm sure he can, can, uh, addresses the concerns in yours. So the question that I have pressing to us today that applies to us today, even though it's not because of food or shelter or clothing, is this. Is not life more than what we worry about? 
You see, in 2020, and sorry, in, in 23 AD or, or 30 AD, roughly around that time when Christ is doing his ministry, the biggest worry was for your food and your clothing. But in 2023, it's not that. It's unfortunately something completely different, something that is almost a smack to the face of the bare essentials and the simplicity of life. We worry, we're anxious about not food and clothing, but luxury and legacy and likes. And if I talk to young people, and even if I talk to the elders, usually in this culture, in this day and age, we're not worried about the basic necessity of survival. We're worried about the access in which we can show off. <laughs> because it's no longer being anxious about eating, but it's anxious about eating like no one else. It's no longer anxious about having clothing and protection, but it's dressing and living like no one else. And it's no longer about having just a life that is ordained by God, that is blessed by God, but it's living our best life on earth. And to me, it's strange that we're anxious about something like that. Because I ask myself how far we've come from believers in Christ, the first generation, from our needs and wants that God knows about, which we've read. The Father knows what we need. And yet now they're directed towards being anxious that we don't have access. You see, a long time ago, when someone asked you what kind of phone you have, I don't know, it's screwed to the wall. I don't know, it has a long cord. When we were young, I don't know, was it Mitsubishi? Was it Sony? I don't know, it was some sort of brand. And we didn't care about it. But now if you ask someone what kind of phone they have, they know. Well, it's an Android, it's a Samsung, it's an Apple, it's whatever it may be. But we need to understand is, is the anxiety of the access or is the anxiety, Brother Chris, are you saying that we shouldn't have nice things? That's not what I'm saying. Should we not pray for nice things? That's not what I'm saying. Should we not be hardworking to be able to enjoy the blessings that we have in this country? And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when anxiety enters the picture, it can be sinful. This is what I have to say about that. Is anxiety in itself a sin? No, it's not. When anxiety brings unbelief, when anxiety brings hopelessness, when anxiety brings depression, then it's sin. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12 says this, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. How do we get to an unbelieving heart? By being anxious in the wrong things. By being anxious and having the solution be something outside of Jesus Christ. It's good to be anxious about my children and their walk with Christ because the solution is not in ourselves but in Christ. It's anxious to be about, about wondering what is the future of this church? What is the future of, uh, of, of my marriage? Because the solution isn't in this church or in my spouse. It's in Jesus Christ. And we take those anxieties, like it said in Philippians, and we cast them Onto Christ. We pray. These are our prayers, our anxieties, because our solution is in Christ. That doesn't bring unbelief. The problem is when our solution is in the dollar. The problem is when our solution is in the status. The problem is when our solution is in our family and friends, when it should not be. Because the dollar can be taken away, and the house can be repoed, and your family can let you down, and therefore your anxiety turns into depression, which turns to hopelessness, which turns to an unbelieving heart. So yes, anxiety can, but not always is a sin. I know many times in my own personal life, I know that I am more depressed, I am more hopeless, I am more anxious, I am more of worry when God doesn't answer my prayers for the need of my excess, my promotion, that house, that car, whatever it may be, than I am worried or depressed that God isn't working in this city, or in this church, or in this neighborhood. Because I say, well, God's got that. But then when my answers and my prayers and my worries and my anxiety 
for something greater. It becomes a sin in my life, and I don't know about yours. You see, the thing we have to hear Christ teaching us, even though we might think it doesn't apply to us today, because we don't have to worry about food or clothing anymore, he asks a question that we all have to answer today. Is not your life more than, and think about what you and I are anxious and what we worry about. You see, it's very important because we live in this culture and this society where we, right now, and even our children, have better lives than kings or presidents beforehand. Theodore Roosevelt, which is probably a very famous United States president, he never had a refrigerator in the White House, and he never had air conditioning. But he was a pretty great man. We, I mean, if the air conditioning breaks just for a couple hours, we, we are, we're not pleasant to be around. Domne fereste is the expression in Romanian. He, if he wanted to study scripture, he would ask the Library of Congress to bring big books, and he would ask for theologians and, 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 and people to come and, and you'd spend a whole day what you could search on your phone, what you can look through biblia.com, what you can look through all these apps that can help us be profound in our walk with God. It would take the president of the United States, the most powerful man, it would take him days and weeks and preparation, and all you have to do is just Google it on your phone. And you cut out all that time, all that effort, and you can go deeper and deeper with the questions we have for God. Because there's people out there that don't use the internet for all the bad things out there, but it's people out there that want to make us deeper and deeper into our walk. You can listen to YouTube sermons between now and until Jesus comes. That's how many there are out there. But we don't listen to them. There's resources out there. There's all these things for our kids, etc. But we don't do it. Understand that in this life, we don't have to worry about food. So what are we worrying about? Is not your life more than that? Before the year 1900, in the West, not in the East, in the West, in the Western culture, before 1900 to 1920, the average American lived on less than a dollar a day. A dollar a day. Now, okay, we can talk about inflation and what was that, like $10? Still, it doesn't matter. Could you live off $10 a day? Then you would be anxious. Where's my next meal and my next food coming from? But what you have to understand is that God is telling us not to be anxious, not to worry about these things. Because your life is so much more. And he gives this amazing example. And I actually started to chuckle at myself while I was doing this Bible study last night. Because he says an interesting thing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And in my head, I thought of a little bird with a little sickle or a little hose. And he's just pecking away, putting seed, pecking away, putting seed. And man, if I would have seen something like that, I would be a millionaire. Because everybody would come and pay to see that. But I don't see that. I don't even see them take seed and plant it into the ground. Or like it says here, store up barn houses. And yet the Lord takes care of them. And so when I worry, I should think of myself as the bird who's trying to farm. And thinking, guy, that's not how you do it. God will take care of you. And I'm there anxious. No, no, no. Winter's coming. I got to do this. Like, you don't even know how to farm. You don't even know how to get what you want. No, no, no. That's me. And if I could create t-shirts, I would ask Brother Greg to have a farming bird. And that way I would always remember to look at myself silly when I start being anxious about the things that God has handled. Have you ever thought about that? It's such an interesting picture that Jesus puts. And I love the question that Christ puts. Are you not more valuable than the birds in which he takes care of? Psalms chapter 8 and 139 says this. What is a man that you are mindful of him? 
Amazing that we have a God who is not distant, a God who is not so far away that you can't reach him, that you can't speak to him, that you can't communicate with him, that he just leaves us here to do our own thing and then we die and we are off into uh, oblivion or, or we're reincarnated or we go from suffering to more suffering. No, no, no. The Bible says about me and about you that he is mindful of our lives. Some people say, well, I have no worth. And especially with young ladies, sometimes when we go to these camps, it's very hard to tell them that you are so, that God has in his mind and he, and he thinks about you and he has a life for you and he has a plan for you. And maybe these other girls who are mean at school or at church, wherever it may be, don't give you any value or any worth. Know that God does. And I use this example with some of the girls. I said, what would you do for a million dollars? What would you do for $10 million? What would you do for $100 million? And I said, if I offered you $100 million, not for one, but for both of your eyes, would you give them to me? You would have everything you want. You'd have the nice car. You never would be anxious about anything because your butler would take care of it. Would you give them to me? Oh, no, no, Brother Chris, I wouldn't. What? You're telling me you're worth more than $100 million? Well, I guess I am. All right, well, start living like it. Start acting like it. Start believing in it. Start affirming yourself in this thing. Because some of the times we kill ourselves just to win a dollar, yet when someone offers us unlimited money just for our eyes, he's not saying to kill you. He's not saying to imprison you. He's just saying you can still live your life. You can still eat the good mama liga and the sarmale. You can still taste it. You can still, yeah, I know, but you can't see your spouse. And you can't see your children. And you can't be part of some part of life. And that money doesn't mean anything to me. Okay, then why are we breaking our backs chasing that dollar when that simple example shows that it's not about money? Are you not more valuable than they? Brother Chris, brother or sister Emmy, the kids, the church, the pastor, whoever's listening to this online, you are more valuable to God than the birds. And he takes care of them and they do not starve and they do not die and they can multiply and they can go forward. And you are commanded, yes, to multiply, but more than that, to go out into the world, to proclaim the gospel, to disciple, to baptize, and to teach them everything he commanded. How much more important are you to the plan and the will of God than a bird that sometimes in the morning wakes us up by singing the graces and the goodness of God? Now, I know in this country, you probably get more in trouble for killing a bird egg than you do for a human embryo. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change the fact that in God's eyes, you are more important. That your soul is more important than creation. And I need the young people, especially the young girls, to understand me when I say this. So understand that when you become anxious, understand that God values you more than you think. It continues on. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. I had to look this up. Apparently, that's how you make clothes back then. I don't know how to make clothes, but apparently you have to spin yarn or spin wool or spin whatever. All I know is mine comes from TJ Maxx. So, but in Romania, I'm sure our parents and our grandparents, when they made those really itchy sweaters, right, or those really nice tableau blankets, they did it this way. And again, I don't see flowers growing arms. I don't see them trying to put the string through the needle so that they can say, I need a better petal. I need a better color. I need a better whatever it may be. I don't see creation doing this because sometimes creation has more faith in God than we do because God dresses them in such splendor that even King Solomon, the richest of the rich people, wasn't dressed this way. So even the king couldn't Show off the way that a flower created by God can. And so if the flowers are not there worrying about how do I look, how's my hair, how's my dress, how's my tie, how's my whatever, and yet they are still glorifying to God and they're still beautiful, why do we worry so much about those things in our life? You know, Christ asked the question 
you of little faith, and that's kind of where this comes to. I already said that the majority of the Western world lived off roughly a dollar a day before 1920, and what that shows you is that God has placed us in this country and in this time to do something more than build treasures and barn storing grains for life here on earth. I believe the plan of God was to create a nation that follows God to serve God. Where all the missionaries, they come from America. Why? Because they don't have to worry about being sponsored. There is wealth. There is blessing. There is food there. They don't have to worry about it. So let's send a record number of missionaries. Where they get the gospel right. Where they don't look at who's left and who's right. And that there's freedom, like was said earlier today. Where we can come together here. Where if they did this in other countries or in different times, all of us would be martyred. But we have that freedom. Why? Not to store up treasures on earth and then be anxious that they're empty or that they're small or they're, they're not what we believe them to be or what a celebrity says for them to be or what social media says for us to have. But instead to say we have and we are content. So brother Chris, I want to answer that question for you. Is life not more than what you're living for? Well, a lot of Christian apologists to stump atheists or to talk to people from CEO of Fortune 500 companies, they ask them a simple question. What are you living for? And it's always extremely depressing. You're telling me that you work overtime? You're telling me that you work long hours? You're telling me that you're doing all of this just to have fun on the weekend? Just to have more homes just to have, to be happy, quote unquote, just so that you can eventually retire, just so that you can have a greater influence on policy or on people or on politics, maybe so you can be popular or maybe so that they can remember you. And these are all the questions they give. And First John chapter 2 says that this is the lust of the eyes, lust of the fresh flesh and the pride of life, all of which none of them come from the Father. And this is what everyone is living for. The majority of everyone in America lives for this category. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. And we have to be very careful that we are not anxious, let alone worry about the fact that we are missing out in the pride of life. Or missing out in the lust of the flesh. Or missing out in the lust of the eyes. Instead... We can live a life that is lost. And many people would say, then what's the point? Matthew chapter 16, verse 26 says this. Says this For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? So I brought together a few verses This is how you can lose your life. If you want to know what it looks like, here are some biblical verses. Matthew 6, 33, the summary of the sermon that we're talking about. Seek first what? The kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And then all those things, the food, the shelter, the clothing, the job, the career, the graduation, the spouse, the children. All of those things will be added unto you. Let's be worried about the kingdom of God. Let's be anxious about the kingdom of God. Let's be troubled about the kingdom of God. What? That the kingdom of God is at hand and that nothing is being or very little is being done about it. But it doesn't keep us up at night. But when we have an offer on a house or a car in the driveway that we can't pay for and we don't know what's going on and we stay up at night and we have heart palpitations. But it doesn't matter that nobody was baptized this year. Let's worry about the right things. Let's worry about the king and his kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. Let's be worried and let's be all thought provoked about that. Psalms chapter 73. I never hear this verse. It's so beautiful. 
It destroys the American culture. Whom have I in heaven but you, O Lord? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. Nothing. My flesh and my heart may fail. What does that mean? That, that you know, sometimes I probably will. Sometimes I, I will like that food or I will like that luxury. I will like that vacation. I'm not saying that those are bad things. What I'm saying is that the desire in our heart should be based on Christ and Christ alone. And when our heart fails and our flesh fails and we think something else is better, know that God is good for he is your strength in your heart and your portion forever. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3, the second part that God allows the children of Israel to go through hard times. They were anxious. They were worried. Why? So that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Now godliness with contentment, being content, is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and certain we can carry nothing out of it. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. I know all of you have food and clothing, but the question is, am I content? Because if the answer is no, I can guarantee you, you're anxious about something. My dear brothers and sisters, the reason that Christ tells us not to worry and to not be anxious is because he wants us to be people of faith. And anxiety and depression and faith don't go hand in hand. When one goes up, the other goes down. If you're anxious, if you're depressed, if you're hopeless, your faith will go down. If your faith rises and you put it not in things, not in people, not in accounts, but you put it in Christ, then your worry and your anxiety will go down. I know it's true. If I told you that $100 million is waiting for you two years from now, not right now, two years from now, are you going to worry about anything? When it comes to financial stuff, no. The stock market crashed. Oh, well. But we're promised something way better than $100 million. We're promised to be princes and princesses in the kingdom of heaven. We're promised to be sons and daughter of the great king in which we will inherit eternity with, in which we will forever sing holy, 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 and he will be our king, and he will be in this kingdom, and we will serve him forever. That is a guarantee. The $100 million isn't a guarantee. Yet our lives would look so dramatically different if someone promised us money. Yet Christ promises you eternal life. Our lives need to look different. But mine doesn't. And that's why I'm here. And I figured maybe yours doesn't. And that's why you're here. And maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And whether you pray by meditating or you pray out loud or you pray on your knees or you pray with your hands lifted up, understand this, that when disciples gather together, not when they're separate in a closet, when they gather together and they, play, and they pray together, the place that they're, they're, they're together, it's shaken. It's never the same. And I'm hoping that the words of God through, the, through, the, through the, the Sermon on the Mount shakes your heart to not live this way, to not live anxious, to not live hopeless, but to live one in faith, in trusting not in food or clothing or houses or accounts, but putting only your faith in Christ and Christ alone. Because no one can steal that from you. No one can, even if they kill you, even if they cut you in half, even if they put you in a, in a, in a cell somewhere, Even if they put you in jail, it doesn't matter. They can't take that from you. And it's the promise that we have. And so that should alleviate and should take that burden of anxiety off of us. Man, I don't know about you, but when there are times when I pray and I give it all to God. I mean, I'm I'm serious, just... You know, I'm going through difficulties. I'm going through whatever it may be. It may be with kids or spouse or job or whatever it may be. And I say, you know what? I'm putting this on Christ and I have faith that whatever he does through this, because all those who love God, God works towards the betterment of them. And so if I'm going through this difficulty, I don't know why. I don't know why my house isn't selling. I don't know why I got fired. I don't know why the stock market's crashing. I don't know why this and that's happening. But my faith is not placed in those things. It's placed in God. And it's not easy. But that's why we pray. And it's not easy to live this way. But that's why the Spirit of God dwells in us. And it's not easy to do this day by day if we're not praying. So brother and sister, I'm asking you, 
at Hosanna Christian Church, whether you're watching online or here together, can we please use the next five, ten, however long it may be, to pray to God, to take our anxieties, to take our worries on things that don't even matter, because it's not about food or shelter that we lack, but it's the luxuries in life. I want my mansion to be in heaven. I want my luxury. I want the best food. I want the best drink. I want the greatest parties. I want the greatest time with family and the best church services. I want them to be in heaven. That's where I want them to be. Do I want church to be nice here? Yeah, I do. But I want it to be better in heaven. So I know, I live, knowing that while it might be difficult sometimes here on earth in church, it's going to be perfect up there. And so, brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to ask you to pray together as a body of believers. And I'm going to ask you that you ask the Spirit of God, however he spoke to you, whether it be from the songs or from the children or whether it be from from (coughs) the sermon or whether it be from the testimonies, whatever it may be, the Holy Spirit speaks differently to different ears in different ways. But he doesn't scratch their ears. He convicts their hearts. That's how you know if you're listening to the word of God, to the spirit of God, to the words of God. Is he scratching your ears, telling you everything's okay? Or is he convicting you to repent and to turn from your way? I ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, to meditate on the Sermon on the Mount. To meditate when you're anxious to go back to Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. To remember what's important. To remember that your life is more than just whatever this culture says it is. More than whatever your parents say it is. More than whatever your kids say it is. Life is all about Christ and Christ alone. And on that rock, I ask that we pray together and that we allow the Spirit of God to work in us, whether it's repentance, whether it's thankfulness, but that we come together as one body in prayer. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you so much for the fact that we were able to come as a family and the fact that we were able to come as believers, even though we might have more people online watching than are here in the building, Lord. We're together allowing the Spirit of God to convict us, Lord, through song, through testimony, through sermon, for the single purpose of bringing us to prayer. So that we don't leave a house of prayer without praying. So that we don't leave a house of prayer without responding to you. For all of these things, the preparation, the practice, uh, the, the, the time spent, Lord, the utilities paid, the building that's